All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I'm not Jerry Lee Lewis. But uh, we've got a great video I want to start before I give uh, comments. That's about three and a half minutes. So, you know, you, a commercial sometimes, what I've learned about videography is you can put about 25 minutes worth of information in three and a half minutes if you hire a professional. So, uh, we're going to go ahead and play this short video and then we'll get started. Remember back to when you were a child, playing beneath a tree, climbing on its branches, enjoying its shade. But many years before, someone else had planted that tree. They dug a hole, buried a seed, gave it water and sunlight, and trusted nature to do the rest, knowing full well that the benefits of that tree would not be something they would ever see, but instead they would be for the generations to come. We are all enjoying the shade of a tree that someone else planted. What tree are you planting today? The San Angelo Area Foundation, as a community foundation, works with donors and organizations to carry out their permanent charitable endeavors. Our mission, our goal, is to work with donors and organizations to help make philanthropy and the art of giving money away efficient, effective, for the betterment of our community. We don't know what the needs of the future are, and so the San Angelo Area Foundation is created to help be that philanthropic vehicle for donors, individuals, businesses, organizations to have sustainable resources to meet those unmet needs. We looked around the country and we looked at several other community foundations and we took the best practices of all of those community foundations and we were able to build a state-of-the-art brand new community foundation based on a model that has been around for over a hundred years throughout the United States. When a donor creates a fund with the Area Foundation, we work with that donor to ensure that what they want from their charitable giving happens. And so what we do is we create fund agreements that allow us today, but also for future staff to know what that donor intended when they made that gift. And so our job at the Area Foundation is to ensure that grants are made from that fund to support the charitable causes that that donor intended. The predominant number of funds that we have are what we call endowed charitable funds. And an endowment is a charitable gift that a donor wants to last forever. I always like to use the example that if a donor wants to give their favorite charitable cause uh, a $20,000 gift in their will, we're going to invest that $20,000 and we're going to be able to give 5% away every year of a rolling three-year average. We're going to invest it and we're going to also grow that fund so that we're making that distribution. And so that in 15 very short years, we will have given away that whole $20,000 to that organization and, and then by then that fund, based on past investment performance, would be now worth over $30,000. That's the difference between giving an organization a donation today and giving an organization a gift that will last forever. At the San Angelo Area Foundation, we manage those gifts that will last forever. Thank you. So you saw a familiar face, one of your own. Janet Karcher has been with the foundation now, what, nine years? Nine years, that's hard to believe. Uh, and the San Angelo Area Foundation has been around 20 years. Uh, and I was the first hire. And I was brought over from the gas company, totally unqualified to do what I do. But I understood regulatory business, which in running a, a large charitable organization, you really need to understand you want to stay out of trouble with the IRS and you want to make sure that you're doing everything according to the law. But uh, I also understood about uh, relationships and that's, that is what we're doing is we're carrying out the, the charitable benefit that people have entrusted in us but it's also very much about relationships. And I look around this room and I see so many of you I know uh, your friends, we, 
we, we eat together, we do different things together, and that's what's, that is what a community foundation is. Uh, now, you think about it in the, world, in, the, in, a, in the country we live in, how many churches do you think there are in America? Over a million. Think about that. How many foundations do you think there are? Not community foundations, just foundations. Because we've all heard of a foundation. You know, they've been around a long time. The Carnegie Foundation is one of the old ones that we've heard of. There's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Well, it used to be called that. They, uh, they've gone their way, so there's now just the Gates Foundation. Warren Buffett has a... Uh, he's contributing to that. The Walton Foundation. There's some monster foundations. There's over 15,000 private foundations. There's 850 in the country that do what we do. That's not a lot if you think about it uh, in the United States. And we were created, the ability to be a community foundation was created in 1914. And that was about the time the 16th Amendment was passed a couple of years later. Y'all all remember what the 16th Amendment was. It was a temporary income tax. Did y'all know, did y'all know that it was temporary? It's still around, but you know, just be careful whatever the government gets in your pocket, they'll keep getting there. But it was about that same time they said, but we're gonna give a charitable deduction. Todd's heard this, so apologize if I'm, if catch me if I change my story any. Uh, we're gonna give you a charitable deduction because if you give it away, we're not gonna tax it. And the first deduction on what we call Form 1040, there was one. And it was if you gave to charity, you deducted it from your income and you didn't pay tax on whatever was left over. So if you gave it all away, you didn't pay tax on it. I got bad news, they don't do that anymore. They, they have a formula. But so community foundations, what we are, the, the history have been around since 1914, but the San Angelo Area Foundation, we were started 20 years ago by trustees of the San Angelo Health Foundation. And hopefully y'all have heard of the Health Foundation. They make grants to all kinds of charitable causes in our area. They were created by the sale of Community Hospital uh, 27 years ago. And they got $42 million from the sale of that hospital. And because of that sale, because it was a, a 501c3 hospital, they couldn't distribute the money back to themselves, to directors. There were no shareholders. It was the community. And they set up a private foundation that some communities that sell their nonprofit hospital, they, they say, well, we're only going to put that money back into indigent health care or, or pure health-related items, which would be good if you're in the health care business. I get it. But they defined health as helping the well-being and health of our community. They interpreted the word health extremely broadly, which has really benefited our community greatly. Since the Health Foundation, our friends were created, they've given away over $60 million. Remember, they started with 42, right? They have over 50 million today. It would have been more, but I don't know if y'all have watched your 401k lately. It's kind of been a little rough the last few months. But they gave us seed capital to get started 20 years ago. They gave us a million dollars. And they said, okay, we want you to be able to set some of this money aside, invest it so that you can start giving money away from the investment income. But we want you to take the other part of it. And it's burn capital for those of us in business so that you're never out asking for money to pay for salaries. And for 20 years, we've never had to do that. We've been able to leverage and keep that, that half a million dollars going and reinvesting and administering the foundation, and we're running the foundation, not going out and asking for any uh, overhead help. What's really great in the past 20 years is donors have given and created, like I said in the video, donors create funds with us, and the majority of the funds with the foundation are endowed funds. And so endowed is that fund that lasts forever. Now, does anybody know how long forever is? Till Jesus comes. Amen? <laughs> And I don't know about you, but there's times I'm like, are you coming anytime soon? <laughs> but so we've got to invest it that way. So we've got to uh, uh, find instruments. If you've gone out and bought a CD lately, I don't know, I got something in the mail the other day that said, you can get a three and a quarter percent CD now for 15 months. I thought, man, you know, that's, 
How awesome is that? And then you pause and think, what's inflation? 8.3%. So if you got that CD, how much money did you make at the end of the year? You lost 5%, right? The spending value of your dollar went down. So we're, we're out trying to buy stocks and bonds that have a really long-term performance objective. And we hold our nose during these, uh, like we've had these last eight or nine months, and we don't freak out. We've lived through, two, we've lived through the tech bubble. We've lived through 2008, 2009. We will live through this. There will be good days ahead. How many of you think last year was a great year? Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Right? We made over 15% in that one year on our investments. So sometimes you got to turn the news off and sometimes you got to look at the numbers and really see what's going on. Now, we're talking about you know, what we do at the San Angelo Area Foundation and I'm looking around the room and I'm sitting there thinking, Johnson Street and what you, your membership have done since I've been here amaze me. You know, I see what you all have done and what your members have done with uh, Rust Street, the, the creation of Rust Street, getting that up and going. That blows us away. And so it's wonderful when we got a grant request from Rust Street, you know, that was a quick, easy yes for the Grants Committee to support Rust Street. Y'all were doing so much with Rust Street, there's a, a person in the community who came forward, not a member of Johnson Street, not a member of Church of Christ, came forward and said, I want to create an endowment for Rust Street. I love what they're doing. And I'll put up some money if someone else will donate to it. I don't care who. And so he put up money. So you're, you're changing the world and you don't even know it. Other people are coming forward. Since uh, through San Angelo Gifts, you were hearing about that just a minute ago. We started that eight years ago? Really? That's hard to believe. Uh, Lots of money has come into our community. And it's amplified thanks to generous other donors who come in and say, you know what, it's like manure. I just want to spread it around and I want to help everything grow, right? And they do that, and so every gift that's given is then grown through that. And we're able to run San Angelo Gives at no cost to the charities. In fact, guess what we do? We put money back on it to help these organizations out, to help with Christian education, right? And we couldn't do that if it wasn't for all of the other donors who set up funds like endowments, like for Rush Street, that work with us. Uh, we were looking at the numbers this morning. Uh, just coming through San Angelo Gives and grants that the foundation has made back to Rush Street, there's over $700,000 has gone to support Rush Street just through the area foundation. But we look at that and go, wow, y'all rock. Yeah. That's a theological term, by the way, right? <laughs> you know, these rocks will shout, right? Right? Concho Valley Turning Point, you talk about changing the lives. Does, does anybody in here not know what that organization is? I mean, y'all should. Y'all birthed it, right? But in case you don't, man, run over there and sit down and spend a few hours and you'll come away going, you know, y'all are doing the work. Y'all are the hands and feet of Christ right here on earth and what you're doing. And we're, we're seeing what we've been able to give grants and, and this community has supported. And what is it, over $400,000 has gone back out just to Concha Valley Turning Point. So we're blessed that y'all work with us. Now we get to do this with every charitable organization in our community. Since we started in 20 years ago, we've given away over $145 million back out into the community. So, no, here's the good news. That wasn't me. That wasn't our staff. That wasn't our board of directors. That was donors. That was you who helped make that possible. It's San Angelo and the Concho Valley. That's why I think we live in the greatest place well, until we move on to that, that next uh, mansion in the sky, right? But this is a great place to live because we do really take care of it. Think about that. $145 million has gone out the door in 20 years. 
I, I, I look around at other community foundations that do what we do. You know how it is. Pastors probably look at this too. They look at other churches. They, we participate in list serves and email exchange. How big is your membership? What's the growth? What are you doing in your community? And when you look around and start comparing yourself to other communities around the country, this is the greatest community on, in America with what we do. And if it's in America, it's got to be the greatest community on earth, right? So uh, we, we work with donors, though. I look around the room. I see some of you that I know have brought checks in or have set up endowment funds or work with us. I, we work with organizations who get gifts and come to us and say, we really don't know how to manage this. Will you take care of this? And while we're pretty good today at managing our charitable funds and assets, we want to know there's permanence because boards change. Mission drift can occur. We want to make sure we've dotted every T and crossed every I. Is that how you say it? We want to make sure it's all right and so that we make sure that, it, you know, at each organization in our community that we're still carrying out what that mission and intent was so that mission drift doesn't occur. In these 20 years, it's, uh, I see fund holders who set up funds. We have over 450 different endowment funds at the foundation today. We started with the one. We started with that million dollar gift, and today we have over $200 million in assets. We've given away $145 million, so do the math real quick in your head. It works, and it only works because you all are really taking the parable of talents to heart. And y'all remember that one? Because the pastor's going to have a test here at the end, right? Uh, and I was the guy that was always going, what is a talent? Would, would someone help me with that? Well, there's great, you know, uh, there's too many interpretations or different translations today. But I love the one that, because I think it's accurate, right? A talent is... 20 years of wages for a day laborer. Now think, think what that is. 20 years wages of a day laborer. Well, back then it was that equal to 6,000 denarii. A denarii is 60 grains of, grains of silver. If you take today's silver price, that works out to be $73,400 is what a talent is. Right? Or, or five years' talents. So the parable was the master was going on a long journey, and he brought three of his servants in, and he said, I'm going to give you five, you two, and you one. Remember that story? And he said, I, uh, go and take care of it. Well, the guy who had the five, he went and invested, and, and he grew that 70 today's dollars, I love converting everything, $74,200, he grew it, he doubled it. The guy who had two talents, he invested it, he doubled it. But the guy who got one talent, he was scared to death of the master and he buried it in a hole in his yard. I think we would call it, put it under the mattress, right? And then after, I love the story because it, 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 there's, there's so many different ways of saying it. After a long journey, the master returned. Now, I don't know how long a long journey is, but you think back 2,000 years ago, that was probably years, a long journey. I'm going to say it was seven years because in the accounting world, there's the rule of 72, right? And money doubles if you invest it and you earn an average of around 8%. It doubles in roughly seven years. So I'm saying he was gone about seven years. How happy was he with the guy who invested it for good? He was very happy. He was so happy, he took the money that the guy had, that had also had doubled his money but only had two, he took his and said, give it to him. But the guy who had buried it in the yard didn't lose anything. He gave it to the guy who had five. And then, depending on the translation, that guy went to a bad place. He was not happy. It wasn't you're fired. He sent him to a place where there's gnashing of teeth. Now, from my old upbringing, that's not where we want to go. Uh, the story there is, to, to paraphrase another scripture, to those that much is given, 
even those that many, much is given. Much more is expected. You all reflect that. And we get the opportunity at the Area Foundation. Our prayer is that we're that servant who is taking the five talents. And in the example I gave, uh, not only are we investing it, trying to double it in seven years, but more importantly, it's not just about growing assets. It's about giving that money back out. And, and several of our older funds have almost doubled in size and have given away the corpus. In other words, what are the original gift amount has gone out the door and the fund is still there and it's grown. So we're here trying to make the world a better place. We have a lots of products that we use to do it. We call them products. Avenues, you know, there's the giving day is a great fun way to give one day. And we always like to say 364 days a year, we, we ask people about setting up endowments and creating estate plans so that we can work with them. But one day a year we have fun. And we see how much money we can get in the door in 24 hours to help the causes that matter. And then we get that money back out amplified. And what does it take us? Three weeks? Two weeks? Two weeks. We get the money back out there. We don't make any on it. Thank you for letting us be the San Angelo Area Foundation to, to put this back. That's kind of in a nutshell what we do. Janet will tell you, I, and, and, and I know Alan. Alan is a former board member way back many years ago. You haven't changed a bit. I know I haven't aged any right. Uh, I'd rather answer questions uh, because I could talk for four hours nonstop without taking a breath. And, I, and Brian knows that too. So, you know, uh, ask me some questions. I'd rather have a conversation than me talk about. So, we went to high school together in Brownwood. <laughs> Brownwood line over here, class of 1980, right? You weren't supposed to tell him that. Oh, I wasn't supposed to tell him that. Well, you graduated when you were young. I was very. She young. was. I think she she skipped ahead several years, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I couldn't resist. Yeah. I've got my wife with me today. We snuck up. We we snuck out of our church choir a little early to come over here tonight. And I said, "You want to come with me?" She goes, "Yeah, I haven't heard you talk in a while." And she's over here going, "Yeah, I have." <laughs> <laughs> what can I answer, Michael? How do you determine um, like are there grants or or funds that you say no, we're not going to. That's not for us. Or that is something that, all right, do you have a criteria by which you decide uh, what funds you'll take and you'll manage and other funds that you say, no, that's not what we do? Yes. So everybody heard Michael's question. Is, do we have a criteria for, we have a gift acceptance policy. And, and if someone uh, it, it does, this is the great part about San Angelo is you don't get uh, too many off-the-wall requests. We have to be able to legally manage it for our community. And so that, that's most of the time what we're looking at is, is it an asset we can legally manage? And then we look at to make sure is that charitable cost consistent with the mission that our board thinks is really important in our community. Thank goodness we live in San Angelo. I wouldn't want to be doing this job I have today if I were living in San Francisco. We need to pray for them. But I'm really happy we're here because it makes our life really easy. Now what we do get, Michael, is donors will give us money and they'll say, I want this just to be a scholarship to help kids go to college. And I want them to graduate from Cornerstone and go to college. I really don't care where they go, but will you manage that fund? So that's, that's a, that's, we have several endowments like that, for example. Or if someone sets up an endowment just for Rust Street. We manage it, grow it, and then we have a, you know, whenever Rust Street says, hey, we're ready. I haven't, I got, I hadn't gotten the hand sign yet, but whenever they're ready, it's growing. People can name their will to the foundation, to that endowment fund. And it's a way of knowing that we're going to keep Rust Street going after we're all gone, right? That's the most important part. Uh, so we get, those are designated funds. We love funds where donors come to us and say, I just want to make San Angelo a better place. And I trust 
what y'all are doing at the Area Foundation. I trust that you have a volunteer board of directors that changes. We, have, we go through terms, so it's not stagnant. We're not just, it's not our money, it's the community's. And when they say, it's unrestricted. Give to whatever y'all determine is good. And so we call it the Give for Good Fund. And we love those kind of gifts because guess what? Twice a year we accept grant applications from every nonprofit in the community that wants to apply. And then we get the job of reading those grant applications and trying to decide which one we're going to fund. And it's, it, there is a limit of how much money you have. We'll get millions of dollars of requests and we may have a half a million to give away that cycle. And you know what I've discovered? There are no bad grant requests. There are no bad charities. They're all doing good work. So you really have a hard time sometimes going through and trying to say, how can we make the best impact with what we have? So that's a unrestricted, or we get field of interest where they'll, they'll let it still be somewhat unrestricted, but I only want to fund certain things. Ergo, I don't want to fund certain things. So we, we honor that as well. We have donor advised funds. That's really a neat thing. It's like a mini private foundation where donors, while they're living, can set up a fund, add to it in their lifetime, give money out of it during their lifetime. They can pass on the advice and consult capacity of that fund to their children like you might with a private foundation. But you didn't have to go hire a, a team of lawyers and accountants and investment consultants to manage it, and you don't have to pay excise tax on it, have a mandatory distribution. We take care of all those things. So we have donor advised funds. So those are some of the products we manage. I almost saw a hand, Phil. So just curious about this money. Uh, as you invest it, is it is something you do from a single account? Or does every fund have to have its own investment? investment? So everybody, everybody here feels, is it, is it a multitude of investments? Or is it one big investment and we allocate it out? And so it's the latter. So think of it kind of, if you understand how a mutual fund works, uh, a mutual fund company owns hundreds if not thousands of stock or bond positions and then you buy a share in the mutual fund and you get a pro rata return of how that mutual fund works. It's almost identical, in fact it uses the same algorithm on our software to calculate the return on investment. So whether you have a million dollar fund or a $10,000 fund, if we earn 15%, they all earn 15% back going down. And that's how it's administered. So I'm really happy there's awesome software. And we really had great software even 20 years ago and they've upgraded and it's gotten better. I talked to some of the old foundations and they're like, we still have the ledger pads, you know? And I mean, you had an army of, you know, calculators with machines and, I think about, that's why they had a lot of staff back in the old days, and uh, the auditors still come in. That's what's great. We're independently audited every year by outside auditors. We have to get someone from Abilene because we know every accountant and auditor in San Angelo, and we want to have someone independent of us and independent of our community. So Conley and Company comes down, and, and they audit us, and, and it's wonderful to open all the books up. It's even more fun whenever they close and everything looks good. <laughs> but you know, So we're audited as well. Uh, we do have state law that we're required to follow. Uh, if you manage institutional dollars for, for donors or other institutions, you have to follow. There's a state law, the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act that was passed in 2009, uh, and it's been it, and that's different versions of prior versions. They didn't have the word, uh, the, it used to be UPMIFA or UMIFA, and then they put a P in there because they thought prudent might be good to have. And, and, but it, it defines what is an endowment, what's a reasonable return, how to determine what are reasonable risks. And it talks about that in the, in the parable of talents that uh, he, he gave, the, you know, the master gave the talents to the, servant who invested well, he was willing to take a risk. It even has the word risk in my translation. He was willing to take a risk to, to double my money. He didn't say he had to. He said, do something. Because burying it in the backyard in a hole, the way I looked at it was if God has given you talents and you do nothing with it, that's a sin in my mind. I, I read it that way. 
Phil? No, Brian? Long time no see. Hey, good to see you. Do you take uh, gifts other than just cash? We do. So that's part of our gift acceptance policy. Will we take anything? Almost. We, we, we can take cryptocurrency. Uh, Children? We, 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 <laughs> indentured servanthood, yes. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, we help kids go to college, but we don't take children. Uh, uh, I mean, real estate, you know, so there's people's home, ranch. You, you'd be surprised how many people die without someone to leave it to. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff. So we, we, we get involved in administering the stuff of an estate. Royalties, so mineral interest. Uh, some of our bigger gifts have been closely held interest in a company. Not, so it's not a publicly traded company. We love publicly traded stock. Those are really good and easy to do most of the time unless you try to do it two days before the end of the year and then it gets a little, gets a little challenging because the market gets really busy then. But uh, closely held companies. So, uh, you know, and I have permission to share the story of Mark McLaughlin. Uh, if y'all don't know who Mark McLaughlin is, he's still alive. He's 92 years old now. Uh, he's the founder of Texas Bank. And back in the 70s, he bought wireless telephone spectrum space from the FCC. And there's a company that was formed shortly thereafter called West Central Wireless. Let's just say his, and, and Mark has given me permission to share the story because I would not share a story like this unless I had his permission. So there's a term called basis. In other words, what he bought that spectrum for and that company has been built. He's got a large percentage ownership in that company, or he did. And it's, it was worth a lot of money. And CTC Communications was coming in to buy uh, West Central Wireless, and so he had what we call a windfall event. And our good friends in the U.S. Treasury see that as an opportunity to tax <laughs> what's called capital gains. But they give you a, an opportunity that if you give away the interest in the company before you sell it, you don't pay tax on that portion you gave away. It's avoided capital gains because you gave it away, right? What's even better is you get an appraisal for what that was worth, which is going to be pretty close to what it sold for. You get a charitable deduction off of the other income you have. And remember now you're, you've made it to a really high tax bracket whenever you have that windfall event. So his uh, cost was like $20,000 and gave away $2 million and didn't have to pay the tax on the capital gains, but also got a charitable deduction. His fund, that was $2 million gift he created, is now worth $4 million, and he's given away over $2 million from his fund. Uh, I appreciate Mark giving me permission to share that story. If you don't know him, he's probably one of the smartest guys still around uh, <clears throat> and is very charitable. So we take pretty much anything. We will not take a timeshare. I, I, I found that out. What's the most inter interesting non-cash gift you've taken? Interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, a plane, a no, we haven't done any airplanes or helicopters. I tell you, taking interest in town and country food stores before they sold the stripes was very uh, educational and was very wonderful, and the family. Uh, that was involved in that transaction, again, have given us permission to sh tell their story. Uh, it was, again, it was, it was, they were able to avoid taxes, but then they turned right around, and I mean, they've put more than what they gave has gone out into the community, and it continues to grow. Uh, that was a complex transaction. Uh, I don't, settling in a state of a, of a widow that had some interesting stuff in her estate. You saw things that you were like, she sat up late at night on TV buying stuff off of, you know, 1-800. Most of it was worthless, sadly. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's, thank goodness she left what she did have to charity, so we were able to help salvage some of it. Gus, you had your... You may have answered it and not missed it. 
that he allow your young heart for those who set that uh, the account to stipulate or she suggest how it is best. So, so how will we allow a donor to recommend? There's the word we want to use because the IRS will get. Uh, takes issue with if you control a gift after you give it away. But you do have the ability to recommend how those funds should be invested. Uh, we have to agree on that, and we have to agree, is that a what we're investing in, or is it who's managing it? Those are two things you have to look at. And if the return on what you're investing in, in other words, if you're investing all in bonds, and do you want it to grow for inflation? Well, then your distribution rate would have to be much less than what we're getting right now because we're in stocks and bonds. Because bonds, well, the treasury just went up to 4.2% for a two-year treasury. But I can still remember when it was 2% and inflation was over 2%. So you can't give away 5% if it's an endowment. So it, it can be done. We just have to work out the details and we do permit that. But it's called the key word, remember, recommendation. Anybody work for the U.S. Treasury in here? I want to make sure we're using all the right words, right? Did I answer your question? Thank you, sir. Bill? So the word area in there, what is your area? 17 counties. Okay. We, we serve Tom Green County and the surrounding uh, 16 counties. So uh, Sonora on the south, Ozona, uh, and then come, if you drew a circle and came up around Glasscock County or Garden City, Sterling City, and then come around, go across the north, uh, picking up uh, over to Ballinger, you know, Robert Lee, Bront, come back down over to Brady. We don't go to Early. So, you know, we carve that. That's Brownwood, uh, and, and Brownwood goes under Abilene. Uh, so we have neighbors that do what we do in Abilene, and we have neighbors that do what we do in the Permian Basin. And we all share, and, and, and if someone from uh, Sterling County wants to work with the Permian Basin Area Foundation, because that's where their lawyer and their accountant and their investment advisor is, and they go up there, that's fine. That doesn't, that doesn't hurt us. And if someone from uh, Nolan County, you know, they, they should go over to Abilene, but we've had people from Nolan County come over and go, well, my lawyers and my accountants are over here. I'm over in San Angelo to see the doctor anyway, I just as soon work with you all. We work all together. We share very well. Other questions? Good questions. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, when you're talking about endowments, is there a minimum that you have to minimum To start it, is there a minimum to start an endowment fund? So I, it's a two-edged answer. So I'm not a politician. I'm not trying to dance around it. The minimum is fifty thousand to start an endowment. But we say, however, we also have people come to us that say, well, I want to set up a fund that does this. And we'll ask, well, how much do you want it to give away every year? And well, I want to give away $1,000 for a scholarship every year, but I only have $5,000. Well, you can do the math real quick in your head. That fund's only going to last about five years. We'll still set it up. And we'll just understand, okay, if you don't add money to it, it's probably going to go away in five years. So, but, so did I answer it? There is a minimum, but there's an exception, and we work. That's what's great about San Angelo, is we're not some great big corporation. We all uh, work with each other, and we make sure we can do whatever we need to do. Chances are, a lot of folks will come and go, well, I only have this much money. I want to set something up, but this is what I want to do. And they'll explain it, and I'll go, well, did you know we already have an agency that does that? And they already have an endowment fund that supports what you just said. Why don't you give to that agency? And why don't, you know, uh, and help them? And so we, we don't always take all the gifts, I think is one of the questions Michael or somebody asked. We don't always... We don't. We kind of talk people out of giving money because there might be a better place they could put and employ that because there's immediate need today, and I'd rather see that money going to work when there is immediate need. You may have already answered this as well, but say you do put the fifty thousand in, hundred uh, percent of that fifty thousand goes into the endowment or, or whatever you contribute. The investment not, pool. There's not a there's not a cost to the contributor. 
So there's not an upfront cost to the contributor. So we have to, we, we, we do uh, charge an administrative fee on funds. Uh, and as the fund gets bigger, the fee is a, is a declining amount. It's very similar to how trust departments would work uh, at a trust department in a bank. Uh, it starts out at one and a half percent on an annual basis and then it goes down time. So there's no upfront. Really easy to go talk to y'all. Y'all get it done. It's extremely easy. It's free to come talk to us. And if you walk out the door without writing a check, we still love you and we still want to help you carry out your charitable needs. We've got a team. You know Janet. Janet, say Janet. Y'all know Janet. She's a member here. If you didn't know that, she hides in the balcony. She tells she tells me she's a balcony creature. She's so a balcony she's a balcony person. Uh, I, have, I have proof. I have proof right here. We got other balcony persons here. I, I saw another one earlier that fessed up. I love it. There you are. Uh, we also have, uh, so Janet works in that. So Janet runs San Angelo Gibbs for the San Angelo Area Foundation. If y'all think San Angelo Gibbs is awesome, y'all need to give a shout out to Janet Karcher. I mean, she rocks it. <laughs> and she's really good at putting together all of our communications that we have and that we do and is it all in charge of our marketing and communications and which is then part of what we in our business call development. That's a really fancy word for begging. <laughs> okay. And Mason Brooks uh, joined the foundation a couple of years ago and, and he works with Janet and I. We're the begging team. You know, I'd rather just be honest about the, the, the best part about our begging is it sells itself. We say this is what we do. If people say, I want to support that, I want to jump on board, we're working together, and if they don't, we still love on them and say, that's great, go out and do good. Uh, but that's what we, we have a full-time accountant on staff. Uh, that we could not live without, because there's a lot of transactions, a lot of uh, stuff going on, and it's great to have a full-time accountant. We love accountants, by the way. You know? <laughs> not everybody does. We love accountants, and we've got a great, we have a great CPA on our staff, and then we have uh, uh, two people that are pretty much full-time dealing with grants. So if you take money in, you have someone accounting for it, we are investing it. Now you got to get it out the door. You got to give it away. So we have two grant scholarship folks that that's pretty much what they're doing all the time is working. We, we manage over 140 scholarship funds and we give away about a million and a half in scholarships a year, that is a two-person full-time job. And that's, and that's, you know, giving money away, you gotta have people doing that, and it's more work than you think. So I was gonna ask what, what you took to give away a year? Uh, the last few years, we've been averaging a little over $10 million a year. Uh, I do thank you for the plug. Uh, we have annual reports that are at the back of the table. I actually have someone reading one. Yay, I love it. The hold it up, shine it over here. Uh, so, and it really looked good because it was before the market went down this, you know, earlier this year. But uh, it, it shows how much money came in. Uh, you know, we're, we're bringing in this, these last few years, it's been in excess of 20 million a year in new funds. And, and we're, we're focused on, on giving away an average of 5% of a rolling three-year average. Some of our funds permit giving away more. Some of our funds, they want to hold it and keep that powder dry, and let it grow. And then we have St. Angel Gives, which is a pure pass-through. So. so this may be a Janet question, but what, what is the, uh, how do you determine who participates in St. Angel Gives? Because with 400 and something funds, so you don't have to have a fund with us to, to participate in St. Angelo Gifts. So we let the senior ministries, senior life ministries participate. So they're not, they're affiliated. They're not a standalone 501c3, but they're affiliated with a standalone 501c3, Johnson Street, right? And so the, the definition is anything that the IRS would consider charitable which is churches, which is uh, public parks, libraries. In other words, ASU, uh, if you want to support a program like the food pantry at ASU, well, you know, I'm not sure ASU really qualifies as a charitable organization, but the IRS thinks that if you give money that's going to help 
lessen the burden of government, helping society, it's religious, or it's helping in education or scientific research, that's the definition of, of uh, charitable. And as long as they meet that definition, we're looking for a federal EIN number <laughs> because we're going to put that on our 990, and that's what the IRS is going to check. So, Can you tell us a story of some organization or a person whose life was changed through something that you were able to do? So I, I have a group of people I'll talk about. Uh, in 2018, on September 21st, Seven draws on the south side of El Dorado started catching rain. And there's, I didn't know this, but there's seven different draws or arroyas that go into Sonora and they, and they flow into the Devil, Devil's River and then heads on down to Lake Amistad at some point. Now, you know how West Texas rains are. They're rare and few, and when they do rain, they're usually over one area, but in September 21st of 2018, all seven draws experienced incredible rain to the point of it rushed into Sonora and there it met uh, a coming together problem and a lot of wood and a lot of debris came with it. It stopped up at some of the bridges and draws and backed up and acted as a dam and then flooded backwards into Sonora. There are 1,300 housing units on the tax rolls in Sutton County. 1,300. Think about how big San Angelo is. So this is down in Sonora. 310 were flooded. There were 22 had to be demolished. We opened up a fund for the Sonora Relief Fund that day. Uh, we got a call from a board member, Brady Johnson. I don't know if y'all know Brady, who lives in Sonora, and he says, we need help. What, how do we do? We had just passed a disaster policy of how would we administer if a disaster happened? Okay, y'all, you know, big corporations, everybody has a d disaster recovery or disaster preparedness. You have a plan just in case a tornado or a fire hits your building. It never dawned on us, oh wait, this might be someone else's disaster. And it was a disaster in Sonora. Think, I mean, over 25% of the housing stock left their roles. And people were going, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? You know, what was great is American Red Cross showed up and they inventoried the damage. They, they had it on a great spreadsheet and they handed out, you know, they helped everybody with a gift card. Here, here's assistance for food, for gas, whatever. They were there. We, we, we love the Red Cross. They were there immediately. Now, as great as that was, they were gone within a couple of weeks. So. It was never declared a federal disaster. Because we found out federal disasters require $32 million worth of damage. And it wasn't that much. Now, thank goodness the county judge declared a disaster, and Governor Abbott declared it a state disaster. And then that opened a door for us to be able to say, well, we can accept grants and give money to help people whose homes were damaged in those floods. Now, you can only imagine most people don't have flood insurance if they're living in the barrio in the floodplain. They, they, their house is uninsurable. They don't even have any kind of insurance, and it's a pretty small structure. Uh, there were people devastated. Nobody lost their life, thank God. But uh, we were able to help uh, over, it was over 200 different families uh, some homes were very much able to be salvaged. Some were able to be, people were able to be relocated. But in, uh, it took us about 60 days. We had over three quarters of a million dollars raised and distributed back helping families in Sonora. And I have a file box full of thank you notes and stories of about how that knowing they had $10,000 to help fix their house and get the sheetrock out and get the mold treated. And maybe y'all sent a mission team down there. Some of you probably you know, participated or youth participated. I think every church in the Concho Valley showed up trying to help and they were helping remediate because floodwaters came up and they went down that fast within a day. But they left behind a bunch of nasty stuff. And uh, we, we changed the lives of a lot of folks in Sonora. It was May of the next year, a tornado hit Bradford, 
and damaged over a hundred homes. Uh, hopefully, you know, y'all may have been out there helping uh, re-roof homes, put tarp on homes. Uh, several of them ex received very extensive damage. And again, it always seems like tornadoes and floods hit the people who don't have insurance, right? And so uh, we were able to raise a couple of hundred thousand dollars and get disaster relief and help uh, people. I mean, it, and sometimes it was a matter of they just, they needed to have uh, a, a new, uh, gas line put in because their gas line was was damaged in the storm. Well, now if you've ever had to get a gas line replaced, now you got to have a plumber. Now you got to bring everything up to code, and what turned into what looked like it might have been a thousand dollar problem quickly became a five thousand dollar problem. We were able to help people like that. Uh, winter storm that occurred. Y'all remember we had this thing called COVID. And do you remember there was no water? And then do you remember it? It was snowmageddon. Uh, I was in Disney. You were in Disney. <laughs> uh, we we again got that call. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, Lord, maybe you're maybe you're getting our attention. So it was another disaster. So by now we've kind of we're trying to figure out this disaster stuff. I Man, we had the fund turned on. We were accepting donations. The Health Foundation. Uh, gave a grant to help us. We had two other foundations. They saw what we were doing in the others. They say, y'all are setting up a fund. We're going to send you $100,000. Get it out the door. You know, and so we, we managed. And so what was the result of helping there is we work with Galilee Community Development Corporation. I don't know if y'all have heard of Galilee. Great organization. They had a, a, a lineup of about a dozen plumbers they called and said, go out to this house and triage it, fix it. And guess where they all are? You know, most of the homes that don't have insulation, that had the water line coming into the house, uh, it froze. And when it broke, it flooded the house. And that, that just, and guess what the city does? Of the city, I'm not ragging on the city here. They go out and turn the water off, right? Because it's flooding the house. Now they have no water. We got to get it fixed. And Galilee, through their plumber network, and they, they do rehabs on low-income homes, fixed over 113 homes in less than seven days and had them back running. And we could, and we paid for all of it. And when I say we, our community paid for it. Other foundations that gave us money. So we, and, it, and it's really helping. It, would, it wasn't all of our great friends living in Bentwood, you know, even though we, they were without power and they were without water. Uh, they could. They had insurance. They could call a plumber, and they took care. Of it. it was the uh, those that were definitely in need. So it's a blessing to get to be able to respond quickly whenever there's needs like that. Now, what's the best part is whenever people give us money and say, "This happened. Here's some money. This is for the next disaster." And so we've invested it, and we're sitting on it. And I pray to God every night, please let this disaster pass. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.